Well, hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Caitlin McKeegan, and I am a Master Gardener, and I'll be your moderator for this evening. Welcome to our Virginia Cooperative Extension Plant Clinic, All About Veggies. These plant clinics are sponsored by the Virginia Cooperative Extension Program of Virginia's two land-grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. These plant clinics are staffed by Master Gardeners from the Fairfax County Master Gardeners Association, and we share science-based information about gardening and horticulture topics. This is our presentation for the evening. This evening, we're going to start with Bug Watch. This is a feature that we've done throughout this season. Terry, I'm not going to take any more time. I'll turn this over to you um, to tell us about the Harlequin Bug, which is our Bug of the Week. Well, thank you very much. Uh, again, I'm Terry Bachman, and good evening. This evening, I'm going to spend just a brief little bit of time talking about a very mischievous insect, the harlequin bug. And its common name is actually derived from a character from medieval theater. Typically, that character would wear a mask and was costumed in a checkered pattern. So you kind of see that similarity in this, in this insect. The harlequin character is often zany or clown-like in a devilish way, but there's nothing funny about the harlequin bug because on the right there, you can see the kind of damage that this harlequin bug can do. The harlequin bug, the Mercantia histrionica, entomologically a true bug. That means it's an insect in, uh, it's an insect in the same order as the stink bug. Many people incorrectly think of them or consider them beetles, but beetles have a hard protective covering over the entire abdomen, and these, these are only over the upper abdomen. Also, harlequins have an incomplete metamorphosis, which is, means it goes from egg, nymph, and adult, rather than beetles, like butterflies, that would have a complete metamorphosis from egg, larva, pupa, and adult. For the graphic that I have on the left here is to help people appreciate the identification of these insects in its, its various phases. Um, the biology of a harlequin bug, it, um, it completes two to three generations per year. And that's the, that's the important part that I wanted to highlight. So this can be create real havoc for vegetable gardeners if it's not controlled. Female, females mate throughout their lives and laying masses of about 12 eggs every three days. So the one female could be over 150 eggs. Harlequin bugs are often clustered together rather than randomly dispersed through the, gar through the garden. And adults produce aggregation pheromones that cause them to congregate. And we'll talk about that. And I'll talk about that when I, when I go a little bit further into trap crops as a management strategy. Host plants, uh, harlequin bugs prefer feeding on uh, plants in the Brasecchia family, also known as the mustard family. And, but there's over 3,700 species of those. So favored host plants are mustards, turnips, cabbage, but other preferred host plants include broccoli, cauliflower, radishes, collards, but also asparagus, bean, cantaloupe, onion, pea, squash, tomato, and fruits like grape, peach, pear, or raspberry. So harlequins are problematic in our vegetable gardens and our fruit gardens. Plant damage. Like other insects, the way that this bug causes its damage by is inserting its beak-like mouth part into the plant, uh, plant tissue and sucking out the fluids. So the damage appears as stifling or lightly colored cloudy spots and significant damage can cause plant death. From a cultural control perspective, cultural measures should focus on sanitary efforts, particularly removal of crop debris in the fall or early winter, which is why it's so important that we're talking about this right now. Another cultural control is that in early spring, har uh, harlequin bugs like the wild mustards. So if you're controlling that weed, you're gonna do a good job controlling this bug. Trap crops, as I mentioned uh, a little bit, is because the harlequins like to congregate. And uh, so sometimes you can provide a desired host and if you actively control the desired host, you can control the bug. So kale and fall is a recommended option or mustards and radishes in the springs and cleum, which is actually, which is actually an annual flower plant is a desired plant of the harlequin. But once again, make sure you control it. Otherwise you could end up 
adding to your population and, and not actually controlling it. And then biological and chemical controls. Biological controls are limited. Harlequins have of predator defenses. So they're distasteful to most of your beneficial insects and birds, although ladybugs and lacewings will eat the eggs. And chemical controls are not recommended, obviously, on our, on our vegetables since we want to ingest these. However, sometimes if you are going to be using a trap crop method, you could think about using the insecticide on the plants that you will not be ingesting. So that's my highlight of a very uh, beautiful but problematic insect. And I just didn't know if there were any questions or I will throw it back to Caitlin. Thanks, Terry. I don't see any questions yet, but of course, um, as I shared earlier, if anyone thinks of any as we go on, I know sometimes it takes a little bit for those to percolate, but that was a great presentation, a lot of really good information. We're going to move on to our first presenter, and that's Sonia, who is here to talk about winter cover crops. So this is something, again, many of us might not be familiar with, might not know how to use. So Sonia, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Caitlin. My name is Sonia Berdia, talking about winter cover crops, which are also called green manure by some people. And they're, they've been used in agriculture, but lately they've become interesting for home gardeners as well. So there's a lot of benefits to cover crops. They maintain the healthy biology of the soil, lessen er soil erosion. There's a added organic material when either the crops die with the frost or you turn them under in the spring. The added organic material improves soil quality, nutrients are added, weeds are suppressed because the cover crops will crowd out the weeds and the soil permeability is improved. Winter cover crops are the ones are recommended for the home gardener in Northern Virginia. So these are crops that are planted in the vegetable garden towards the end of the growing season, starting mid-August and going through mid-October, you can plant some of these. And the recommendation is that you actually, rather than using one type of cover crop that you mix seeds of a combination of legumes and non-legumes, and you can actually buy uh, pre-mixed seed packages. One thought that I came across is that for the newbie uh, green manure person, that oats are an easy crop to try it out because oats die with the first frost. So you're not gonna end up with cover crops growing in the spring on your, on your garden beds. You're just gonna end up with this nice uh, biomass from the oats. They also recommend trying winter rye because in the spring you can pull those easily. And then the, the final recommendation is if you do choose to do a cover crop that flowers, such as crimson clover, you want to make sure and cut it back before they go to seed. So when you think about 30% of the flowers have bloom, that's the time to cut it back. And that's when you'll have the maximum amount of nutrients from the, from the cover crops. We basically mow it down before it goes to seed and then you have a new problem. So here's some of the legume cover crops recommended for Northern Virginia. There's crimson clover and there was a picture of crimson clover already that, with the beautiful little red flowers. It's trifolium incarnatum. It's a reseeding annual, so you have to make sure to chop that down before it goes to seed. And then field peas, and I looked at looked up what that is. Field peas are southern peas or cow peas, such as the black-eyed pea, Vigna unguculata. That's killed by hard frost, so you don't have to worry about that coming in the spring. Harry Vetch and the, the photo behind this slide with the little purple flowers. I think the, the pretty pink purple flowers, that's Harry Vetch. I, I, you guys have probably seen that in the woods. That will regrow in the spring, so it needs to be turned on white clover, which is a perennial, and it's, it's slow to start. And then the Austrian winter pea, Pisum sativum, it will go dormant over the winter and start growing again in the spring. So again, that's one to, to plow under. But the good thing about legumes is that they, they fix nitrogen in the soil. So they're really great to have in the soil to increase the nitrogen in your soil. 
the non-legumes, annual ryegrass, which you can sow all through the summer to late summer, buckwheat, which is actually the photo is, is a photo of buckwheat plants. That's an annual and it grows quickly. That's suggested as a summer cover crop. Again, we talked about oats. There's something called tilling radish, which is some, such as daikon radish. Those are great because the tap roots break up soil compaction. There's the winter rye, which I spoke about before, which is great because you can hand pull it and put and fly it down. And winter wheat, which is a hardy annual, so it can survive the winter. And then there's the brassicas and the mustards. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about the brassicas and the mustards in the next slide. So brassicas and mustards, they produce these glucosinolates and isothiocyanates that are just regular chemicals in the plant, the plants that suppress pathogenic fungi and nematodes. So I started looking into that. And in fact, it, that, you know, in agriculture, when there's a nematode problem that they, they've been trying to use a field of musters to try to really kill those, those bad nematodes and they grow the plant and then they chop it and they mix it in the soil. And then the, the, the plant biomass releases these, they're essentially like pesticides, it's organic from the, from the mustards into the soil. And then that, that actually is toxic to the bad microbes and kills them off. So I think that's, that's pretty cool. So, and how to plant crop co cover crops. You can start them when the vegetables are still growing let, at, in mid-August or so, and you wanna just remove the mulch from the vegetable beds as the seeds need to be in contact with the soil to germinate. And brought, you can broadcast the seed mix, which, you know, by hand, kind of trying to throw them in a sort of even way. And then once you've done that, rake them gently in the soil, and you can just sort of walk on the, on the, on the soil to, to press them into the soil. And then here are my references. The University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food and Environment, The Basics of Biofumigation. That was an article talking about the mustards and the brassicas. It's, it's a little bit more than just your basic cover crop information, but that's, it, it, was, it was just interesting. Well, thank you so much for all that information. I think that's the essence of gardening, right? You start digging into a topic and then, you know, you go down this path and you discover things that you are really interesting and fascinating and we all kind of nerd out a little bit. So thank you so much for that information. Our next presenter tonight is Heather Felton, who is going to provide some information about mulching for your garden and how that might help you over the winter. So Heather, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks Caitlin. So as Caitlin said, I'm going to be talking tonight about winter mulching for your garden. Um, I think most of us know about mulching in the spring and summer, but winter mulching is something you can do to really improve your soil quality and um, suppress weeds especially. Many benefits of mulch in the winter. It helps pre prevent water loss, uh, helps reduce weed growth, and when I get to the um, specific cover crops, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the weed suppression. Mulches keep soil warmer in the, in the winter. I've heard of people who grow carrots and cover them up with some hay and can, can pull them all winter. So some of those cold tolerant crops, you might be able to keep going longer than you normally would. Organic mulches can also improve the soil structures. As it decays and moves down into the soil, that increases the organic material in your soil and improves the quality of the topsoil. Uh, mulches also prevent crusting of the soil surface. So you know, when, when you get rain, it, it absorbs into the soil and sort of, sort of slicking off and you have a, a hard, dry crust, and um, they also help prevent soil compaction. So lots and lots of benefits of, of mulching your garden in the winter. So types of mulch materials, I'll go through some of the, mo the most common and easily used in this area as well. Uh, leaves, uh, two to three inch layer of leaves provides good weed control. I tried this last year for the first time and it was, it was very beneficial. We shredded the leaves with our lawnmower, spread them onto the garden, and it, in the spring, there were no weeds at all until we started moving the um, leaves around and kind of tilling them under. So that was, from personal experience, leaves work well and they're, they're free if you have trees in your yard. So that's, a, that's a, also a benefit. 
Oak and beech leaves will make your soil increase the acid acidity of your soil. So if you have acid loving plants, you can use those leaves maybe kind of specifically around those particular plants. And after the, the leaves decompose, turn them over into the soil and put a new layer of mulch on top. So that it increases your organic matter and uh, the soil structure too. Leaf molds, um, the, like sort of the second stage of leaf mulching. This is using leaves that have, have already started to decompose. It makes it excellent mulch and improves the quality of your soil. And if very decomposed, you can use it as a soil amendment rather than as a mulch on the soil surface. So depending on the level of decomposition, you can decide exactly where you, if you want to pull, pull, till it under immediately or put it on the top. Pine bark, in this area, you have to purchase it, but I thought I'd throw it in here for an option. Again, two to three um, inch layer, that's kind of the magic depth for weed control. You can purchase it at in various particle sizes. You don't want to get the very large bark nuggets, the couple of the pieces of bark nuggets, because they float in water and can uh, run off during a heavy rain. Hay and straw, another really easy way to mulch your garden in the winter after you pulled all your crops. The straw decomposes pretty quickly, so you need to keep an eye on it to, and keep it replenished to keep the weeds down. Everything I've looked at and my own personal experience, the, these mulches, their, their main benefit is to keep the weeds down. And so you don't start your spring garden with just a, like an overgrown weed bed. Straw is best used for vegetable gardens or newly sown lawns. Because it's not particularly attractive, you probably don't want to put it on flower beds in the front of your house. That, you know, depends off on what sort of look you're going for. And the straw also improves the soil as it decomposes. And uh, you need to be careful about any grain seeds that in your straw because they might sprout. So you wanna keep an eye on that. The Clemson Cooperative Extension Mulch actually is, is really beneficial. I got, got a lot out of that. Virgi Virginia Tech Extension has a lot of information on mulches, but those are mostly for summer, spring and summer mulching. So um, Clemson had a great bit of information on winter mulching. So Caitlin, this is Terry. We've had some a couple questions come in. Our first question, which I think we'll probably throw to, to Sonia on, on uh, cover crops is for a small garden bed. What one cover crop do you recommend? Or maybe other master gardeners in the group would throw out which of the cover crops they choose to use. This is Sonia. I think that for the first time, I might try one of the, like the oats, because that seems fairly foolproof. And I'm a little intimidated by cover crops, but I, I think that because the oats grows fast and then dies off so that you end up with an, an organic, a brown organic material that's ready to go in the spring, that might be a, a good kind of introduction to using a cover crop. I guess with a small garden, you don't have to worry so much if something goes to bloom, it's not gonna be a big crisis to cut it back. So I've used winter rye, just straight winter rye. And I've also used the mixes with the, the rye and the, the peas and the, the, turn, or the radishes, the, kind of the legume, non-legume mixes. And I think all of the, those that I've tried have been super easy to use. We just till them under in the spring and don't be intimidated. I just have, I have a pretty small garden and we just put the cover crops directly into the raised beds and it's pretty easy and not intimidating. Okay. That's great. And, and as a follow-on question, would all the today's information this evening about cover crops, and I also assume that means about mulching, should, would, should we be thinking about this for our flower beds and not just our vegetable beds? So I'm not sure if anyone uses cover crops for their flower beds. You know, in the cover crop articles, they they did they discussed how a a garden bed, a flower bed is somewhat like, a similar in a sense to a bed that's a cover vegetable garden with a cover crop because you have bulbs and perennials and annuals like a different different kinds of layering of plants going on there and so a lot of the things that you get from cover crops like weed suppression and permeability because of different kinds of roots 
are sort of already there. That's what I got from, from what I read. And maybe one thing to jump in here, it depends, I guess, on whether or not you're growing perennial flowers in your flower beds, or if it's some, if it's a place where you're planting annuals every year. But like Sonia said, if you have perennials and things that are there, the permeability is already, the benefits of cover crops are, are not so much needed, but if it's somewhere that you're going to put, you know, annuals, then I don't see any harm in a cover crop, right? Yeah, no, definitely. Those, I think, are our questions for now. Great. Well, thank you so much. And thanks, Heather, for your presentation. That was really informative. Knew a lot about mulching in the summer and spring, but had not considered it for the fall, so definitely think about it. So our final presenter tonight is Pinar, who's here to talk about cleaning your tools for winter. And as I said at the beginning, something I am personally very bad about. So I'm excited to hear your advice for all of us. So I'll turn it over to you. Well, I am personally horrible at it too. So hopefully this will be a good starting point for me to get better. Everyone's favorite topic, cleaning. But it's important that we that we clean our tools before we store them for the next season because this one lengthens the lives of our tools and two, it will stop or help stop the spread of germs. There are a few steps in cleaning and storing our tools. First, we need to, to clean them. Then we have, if there's any rust, we have to remove the rust. Then we have to disinfect. Then for the metal parts, use a protective coat, then we can store. And I'll talk about these in detail. The first step is cleaning before disinfecting. And to clean, you can use water and soap or a hard spray of water. If, if there's dirt on the on rough surfaces of tools, you can use a, a stiff brush to brush the, the, the dirt away. If there's sap on the tool, you can scrape it with paint scraper or use paint thinner to wash away, to clean away the sap. If there's dirt between the tines and the handle, it might be a good idea to, to remote, take apart the tool to clean better. And if after all of this, if necessary, you can follow up with a wet rag to just make sure everything's clean. Once the tools are clean, you can check for any rust. If there's rust on the tools, you can use sandpaper to sand away the rust. And when, once that's done, we can move on to disinfecting. And for disinfecting your tools, there are some options out there. I'll just talk about two. One for smaller items and one for larger tools. For smaller tools like hand uh, spades and tines and blades, you can use an all-purpose cleaner. What the references suggested was 0.1% alkyl dimethyl benzyl ammonium saccharnite, which is apparently what all those Lysol all-purpose cleaners are. You can either spray it directly to the tool or you can dip if you have not the spray but the the liquid kind you can dip your tool in it as i said this is a good option for smaller tools but if you have larger tools like your shovel that you want to disinfect you can make a, a bleach mix you use nine parts water to one part bleach in a big bucket and you Dip your tools in there, leave them for a bit, and voila, they're disinfected. Of course, be careful with bleach. Once tools, the tools are disinfected, wait till they're dry. And for any metal surfaces, it's a good idea to use a protectant like WD-40. And then we're off to, to storing our items till 
next time. Make sure you store them in a clean, dry place. You can store them in on shelves or in racks. And just make sure that if there are any wooden parts that they don't are not in contact with soil or concrete. Thank you so much for that information. I think that's all going to be really good advice for all of us as we go pull our tools away for the year. It's hard to believe that the growing season is over, but here we are. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. We have a couple of, you know, wrap up slides here to share with you. And the first is our garden journal. This is something along with bug of the week that we've been plugging every week throughout the season. Garden journaling is a way to help you keep track of what works, what doesn't, what bugs you're seeing in your garden, if they're harlequin bugs, growing patterns, weather conditions, that sort of thing. And it helps kind of track through the year patterns that you're seeing so that you can use it next year. And you know, spoiler alert, next week or in two weeks, our virtual clinic is going to talk about how to use your garden journal to plan for next year. So if you've been keeping it or even if you just start it this week and keep it for two weeks before next before two Tuesdays from now, that would be great. So some important things to note in your garden maybe this year. What renovation or rethinking are you doing as you plan for next year? Now is a great time to split your perennials. You know, that's not a vegetable, strictly vegetable planting topic, but you know, we're all gardeners. We all like all plants. And are there any weeds that are starting to create seed heads that you need to get out of your garden? And, you know, as Terry said at the beginning, what do you need to clean out now so that you prevent pests and diseases for next year? So doing some of that cultural control now will save you time and headache and heartache in the future. And to find additional resources, including articles, weed profiles, and more, you can visit fairfaxgardening.org. We also have YouTube channel. And so if you search the VCE Fairfax County YouTube, you can find all the plant clinic recordings that have been cataloged since summer of 2020. There's a ton of information there, as well as our virtual um, Zone 7 garden series and lunch and lawn series. So tons of resources if you weren't able to make these in real time. So once again, thank you so much for attending tonight. Really glad you could join us. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Thank you again. Happy gardening.